okay, so that's important. You could be an Islamic nation, you could be in, in, in the times of the French Revolution, and you wouldn't be getting these kinds of bad ideas. What I think's happening is the church is then, um, because they know if we live robustly Christian on the issue of manhood and womanhood, we are going to be offending people left and right. So what we're doing is we're kind of shrinking it back. And I, I see that primarily in this whole kind of talk about narrow complementarianism. So you have narrow complementarianism, broad complementarianism. Narrow complementarianism is, is considering what uh, manhood and womanhood does as it pertains to the home and as it pertains to the church, but it's in those narrow spheres. It's not gonna be broad, it's not going to touch upon the world and how we, how we function as created beings. I really think we're compromising. We're just backing up and backing up and backing up, and because we're afraid of yeah. saying something like, you know, a woman should never be a manager of a carabas over a man. Like, we're afraid of somebody saying something dumb like that. I don't hold mm -hmm. that position. Yeah. And we're thinking, as soon as I go out into that space, well, then I'm going to be some, you know, some person that's saying something that ought not to be saying. So we're, we're only saying, you know, the man is the head of his wife. And we're saying that uh, only men can be elders, only men can be pastors, only men can preach. We're saying all of those things. But what, what we're going to have to do is actually wield the sword by showing people uh, the beauty of what God has done in male and female. Again, this is Bible. I mean, I would go to 1 Peter 3, where it talks about woman as the weaker vessel. We are so afraid of that text. It's like, why, why? It doesn't make any sense. Like, if it's real, if it's true, why Why does our stomach still go, oh, let me tell you what this does mean. Let me tell you what this does mean. Let me tell you what this does mean. You know, it's like, no, no, just, it's just true. And so, but rather seeing the beauty and that the woman is the weaker vessel, and the beauty that the man, uh, that strength is this crowning characteristic. And, and then I think it goes even deeper. What I want to point out to Christians is that when you're, if you're wonky on male and female, then you're wonky on God's created order. Yeah. Yes. You're wonky yeah. on Genesis 1-1. Yeah. So it goes back to in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It goes to truth, goodness, and beauty. If, if God is the one who created the heavens and the earth, well, he created the heavens with a purpose. He created the earth with a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. The heavens, what are they to do? Well, you hold the clouds, you know, birds fly around in you. That's what you do. And the earth, what do you do? Well, you know, that's where the buffalo roams and that's where the plants grow. And the heavens can be like, no, 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 I want the plants to grow up here. It's like, well, you're not the creator. So the creator, the creator has created you to do a certain thing. God is the creator of this world. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be there? In the book of Job, uh, God rebukes Job, reminding him that he wasn't there and we weren't there. And yet he talks about, were you there when all the sons of God uh, shouted for joy as he created ex nihilo, when he created land and sea and all of a sudden vegetation sprouted forth from the earth. What would it have been like to watch the first buffalo roam? What would it have been like to watch the first strawberries come into existence? What would it have been like to be there with Adam and Eve and be placed in the garden to work it and to keep it? He's not only created the world, he is our creator. You have a God. You have a creator. And if you believe that much, then you really will get this well, whole lesson here. We don't, we're not our own creator. We don't get to determine our own lives. It was on the sixth day that God created man in his own image. Genesis 1 says, God created man in his own image, male and female. He created them.
hear in Genesis 2 more of the detail of the story that God having created Adam could not find a helper suitable for him and so he puts Adam to sleep. And he takes Adam's rib, his very rib, and fashions for him a wife. A woman, Eve, the first woman. So we see in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2 that there is an order to creation, that there is distinction within creation, and that distinction applies when it comes to male and female. But what are we really talking about? How do you put some meat on the bone of this idea so you begin to understand uh, what is it to be a man and what is it to be a woman? Well, as scripture goes on, there's a number of places that we could go to signal certain specifics about what it means to be man and woman. And this really is um, both a science and an art. People have pushed this too far at times and people uh, have not pushed it far enough at other times. Well, why is this such an important thing for us? Uh, the reason it's important is because that Christian vision of what it means to be created male and female is a manifestation of the Christian faith. Uh, there is a battle going on. The Lord Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under a man named Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. This Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he is king. He rules here. He tells us in Matthew 28 that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him and therefore his followers are to go out into all of the world and they're to make disciples and they're to teach those disciples to observe all that Christ has commanded, including this. Uh, he tells us to pray, your kingdom come, O God, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what's happening is there are other people uh, that would not want the will of God done on earth. Uh, they, they would not want to see the kingdom of Christ come. And so there's, there's a great conflict going on. And where are the battle lines? Well, the battle lines are at truth, goodness, and beauty. So, so the truth of God, reality itself is at stake here. Now, I don't mean that reality is actually going to change. It's, we know you don't break God's laws. You break yourself against God's laws. You're not going to actually break God's created order, but you will break yourself against God's created order. But one of the things that we do as Christians is contend for the truth. Everything we do is about the truth. And so it shouldn't surprise us when it comes to manhood and womanhood that in a text like Titus chapter two, we see certain exhortations given to women, and it actually includes loving your husband, loving your children, submitting to your husband. The younger women are told to submit to their husbands and to be working at home. Now, here's a side note. That does not mean somebody's gonna say, oh, well, he doesn't think that uh, women are to uh, work outside of the home. No, that's not what's implied by Titus 2, but it does say that they're to be working in the home, that the home is their home base. The home is the place from which they launch the missiles and the arrows that go out into the world. So, so the work that is done out there is the fruit of what's being done in the home. It's not being done out there in spite or against what's happening in the home. And that truth is still there in Titus 2. But the Apostle Paul goes on to say um, that women live this way, listen to this, so that the word of God is not reviled. So the very way that a Christian woman 
lives is a matter of the truth. If she lives this way, well, then the word of God is not reviled. If she lives a different way, the word of God would be reviled. And just a few verses later, the Apostle Paul goes on to say that in living as God has called us to live, we adorn the doctrine of God. I mean, what a glorious thing. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because as we live as male and female, we are actually adorning the truth. The truth is at stake here. And we're, we're, women are beautifying that truth by the way that they live in the world. Men are not exempt from this as well. We also contend for the truth and manifest the truth as we live as men. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul speaks of men as the glory of God. And it's a fascinating phrase. Well, glory is something that radiates forth into the world. So man is the image of God and the glory of God signals that he is a representative of God. And as he lives, as a man, as he lives as God would call him to live, as he uses his strength for good and not for evil, as he is an exhorting father who exhorts in the truth and by grace and not in a domineering spirit. As he leads, he leads people up into blessing and he doesn't lead people into destruction. As he does that, he is displaying the truth for the world to see. The New Testament says that the church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. And so here, and in this very place of what you could call broad complementarianism, what you might call living according to God's design, God's created order, Christians are contending for the truth. There is also the battle line of goodness, and particularly by goodness, I'm thinking about purpose. Uh, you know, a hammer is good for driving in nails, and a screwdriver is good for, for tightening in screws, but a hammer's not good for tightening in screws and a screwdriver is not going to be any good for hammering in nails. So uh, something's goodness pertains to uh, its purpose or its goal. And this is true when it comes to male and female as well. Uh, what, what is a man for? What is a woman for? And, and this, this ties back in, this is a huge question because it ties into the glory of God. You know, Christians know the first question to the Westminster Catechism, you know, what's the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so you might say, well, what is man for? He, he's, he's for glorifying God. And what's woman for? Well, she's, she's to glorify God. That's exactly right. But bring it down one more level. How are we to glorify God by living as male and female? There we see that there are these differences here. And we go back to thinking about, man, well, what is he to do? He is for taking responsibility. He's to take responsibility. Well, take responsibility to do what? Um, take responsibility to love God and take responsibility to love others. Where do we see this primacy of responsibility in Scripture? Well. In Genesis chapter 2, as God was speaking to Adam and he gave him instructions that he was not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he was warned that in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, then Eve comes about and Eve goes and takes of that fruit and she eats. She is the one uh, who was deceived, the New Testament says. And again, that uh, rubs against our modern sensibilities. And yet this is what the word of God said. She was deceived and she ate of the fruit. And then she gave that fruit to Adam. And then Adam ate of that fruit as well. And when God came to them and they had hidden themselves from him because of their sin, uh, God asked them, where are you? And he goes to Adam first. He goes to Adam saying, uh, what happened here? And what does Adam do? Well, in his fallen state, the first thing he does is shirk responsibility. And rather saying that I screwed up, uh, he says, that woman you gave me, and he passes the blame to her. And then uh, God goes to her and then she passes the blame uh, upon the serpent. But there is a responsibility there for Adam. What Adam should have done when he came to his wife, seeing that she had eaten of the fruit is he should have taken responsibility right at that moment. He should have not eaten the fruit, but he knew what needed to happen. God had told him what had to happen. Somebody had to die. And he should have done what the great man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ has done. He should have come and sacrificed himself 
right there saying to God, I know someone needs to die. So I'm here to die in the place of my bride. He failed at just that moment, but that's the moment that he should have been taking responsibility. And that's true of us even now. We should be taking responsibility. And so a husband, my goodness, has no right to be sitting in his home and to see that everything is in disarray from laundry thrown all over the house to people being bitter and nasty to each other uh, to, you know, running up credit card debt through the roof. Uh, he doesn't have a, any place to come home and say, well, this is not my responsibility. This is not my thing. This is somebody else's job. That's not the case. It's his responsibility. It doesn't mean that a man is to blame for things that he has not done, but there must be a category where he is assuming responsibility. He's the one who needs to fix it. He's the one who needs to rectify it. He needs to do that uh, by proclaiming the truth to his home in a prophetic kind of way. He needs to do that by, by bringing his family uh, to the throne of grace in prayer and in interceding for them in a priestly kind of way. He needs to do that by governing his family, protecting his family and leading his family in a kingly sort of way. Uh, these truths need to be operating in him, not in a way where he's passing the buck and, buck and blaming people, but in a way that he's saying, oh God, help me to care for my family and please, by your grace, may things be put in order and let me be the leader in that situation of presenting to my family what it means to love you, trust you, and to follow you. So God has defined this purpose for a man. Well, he's also defined the purpose for a woman. Well, what is a woman for? Well, again, you go back to seeing that she is a nurturer and she is a helper. And this is going to manifest itself in a number of ways and at all sorts of times in her life. Uh, she is there to be a help to her husband. And any kind of good helper uh, has to have the ability to know what needs to be done. This, this is why uh, the, the contention that if you think this way, well, then you're gonna argue that, that women shouldn't be educated is absolutely nonsense. Um, what kind of co-pilot do you want that doesn't know how to fly the plane? What kind of counselor do you want in your cabinet meeting? that has no idea of what's going on nor how things should get done. Uh, she is there to be a help to her husband and then she needs the wisdom and the shrewdness to know, uh, like Abigail did in the Old Testament with David, how to make these appeals and to present the truth in such a glorious way that a man who's even about to do something that he shouldn't can be turned from that by this nurturing, helping woman. David was going to kill uh, Abigail's husband in, in, a, in a magnificent way. She sends envoys to David uh, uh, to to signal to him uh, that uh, there has been something that has been done to him. David uh, had been um, offended by Abigail's husband, but she sends these envoys and then she comes down and she takes responsibility even for her husband. Uh, she doesn't take blame for her husband, but she takes that responsibility and she makes appeals to David and David thinks, well, what an amazing thing. My wrath has been averted by the wisdom of this woman. What a helper, what a helper Abigail was to her husband, even in that moment, even as she spoke the hard truth about what he had done and what a help she was to David in that moment. So a woman is a nurturer. One of the reasons that the, having women drafted into the military is such an offensive idea is that a woman is to give life. She is one who gives life. There's an Old Testament text that says, you're not to boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Well, think about what's being signaled uh, there. What is, what is the, mother's, the mother goat's milk for? Well, it's for nurturing and giving life to her child. It's not for taking life. So don't take the very thing that is meant to give life and use it as an instrument of death. This is signaling to us what women are for. There is this other team, this worldly ideology that rejects this very idea of purpose. And, and it's done in a very subtle way. Um, in many ways, this secular humanism or this paganism or this uh, creature worship that is around us that we've been infected with in so many ways um, has, really likes the idea of purpose. You know, when they hear purpose, well, I like this. There is a plan for my life. I have a destiny. I have a future. I'm going somewhere. The problem is, is that purpose does not come to them from the Creator. It's not defined by the creator. And so we think we can, we can create our own purpose and we can uh, become whatever we want to be when we grow up. 
Uh, we're so confused in our times. Uh, we have had a man win woman of the year. Well, how do you do that if you really know what men are for and what women are for? In all of this, God's very purpose in creation, his glory and our good, both of these things are on the line when it comes to how we live as man and woman. There's the third battle line, and that's the battle line of beauty, truth, goodness, and beauty. Uh, what is beautiful? Is it really beautiful when man and woman live together? And it's at this very moment that we see the, the chaos of the world that is around us. Uh, my wife and I were downtown on a date one night, and we went into a particular store, and uh, there was a sign that said, uh, art was upstairs. And so I thought, okay, I'll go up there and see this art. And as I walked up the stairs, I came to a platform and there um, with a back white wall scattered all over the ground in front of it was all kinds of toys just thrown about on the floor in disarray. And then there were four orange road cones around with yellow caution tape surrounding it with the artist's name painted on the wall. And I remember thinking, um, is this art? I, I just kind of thought that my children had made their way through the art hall before I got there and destroyed this. There, there was no beauty there. Uh, there was no order there. It was absolute disarray being presented as if it were beautiful. And this signals to us what's going on when it comes to male and female. What's happening in our times are all sorts of confusions. We're actually inverting uh, what manhood is and what womanhood is, and then we're we're mixing them up, and we're we're falling into all kinds of androgyny where these distinctions are blurred or twisted. And this is a moment for Christians to show the beauty of what it means to be male and female. I am convinced that the world is hungry for male leadership that is not domineering or self-serving. And I'm utterly convinced that the world is thirsty for female beauty that is not gaudy or immodest. Christians have an opportunity here to present to the world the beauty of God's design. What a glorious creator he is. The sun rises again and it runs its course and the moon rises and it runs its course and we see this, this harmony, these distinctions coming together in creation. Uh, but we want to subjectivize beauty. It's really, it's fascinating. I mean, you know, who listens to, who listens to Bach? and says, you know, well, as a man, I just wish there were more bass notes, you know, or uh, as a woman, I wish that there would have been uh, some, some more of the high soprano uh, notes going on in that song. No, the, the, first of all, we're not Bach. Bach is Bach, and we should just sit there and listen to what he has done. And in the same way, we should say the creator is the creator, and, and who am I to say that I'm gonna somehow twist his design and improve it. No, there's glorious harmony that is going on here. In, in scripture, we see this in a number of places. Uh, in Genesis chapter two, when God puts Adam to sleep and then he takes He takes Adam's rib. Think about the very beauty of that. God, Adam's created from, from the dust of the earth and then God puts him to sleep, takes his rib and then Adam says this phrase, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You shall be called woman because you're taken from man. So there is a sameness, you bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, created in the image of God. But there's distinction. There's two bones. There's two flesh. And there's, there's a movement. You are bone of my bone. You are flesh of my flesh. I'm not bone of your bone. I'm not flesh of your flesh. And this is where the Apostle Paul in the New Testament uh, begins to talk about this, this harmony that exists. And he says, you know, um, man was not created for woman, but woman for man. And Adam was formed first. Um, and then Eve was created from Adam. And he says, but, but nevertheless, now man comes from woman. She's the one who grows pregnant and gives forth life to little boys who grow up to be men. And this is a glorious picture things that are unfathomable to us that we can even we can't even begin to comprehend uh, the apostle paul talks in the new testament 
about man being the image and glory of God, but woman being the glory of man. And we could meditate on this mystery forever and, and not even begin to plumb the depths of it. But think about some of the truths that are being signaled to us here. Glory is to radiate. And so here, here at the end of creation, God, God establishes the crown of creation, which is man, mankind. Uh, he is the glory of God. He is radiating the truth about God out into the world. And then it's not good for that man to be alone. And so he creates woman who is, who is the glory of man. People, again, because we're so caught up in our times, we're offended by this beautiful display. How is it in any way a detriment to women to be the glory of the glory of God? You are the crown of the crown of God. There's a sameness, there is a distinction, there is a beautiful song that is being played out to creation as men and women live as God has created them. Things that absolutely stun us. And, and, and even going back to Genesis 2, you were bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and now there are two. And yet the mystery is, is that these two would become one flesh again in sexual union and covenant marriage, and in so doing would be fruitful and multiply and produce more of male and female to live in the world and to be fruitful yet again. So the Christian understanding of male and female is glorious. Nothing can compare to it as we look to God's word and say, here, here, we want to follow what you have laid out for us. We want to trust you, we want to obey you that we might display the beauty of your design. Thank mm -hmm. you.